said that there's a workshop going on. Uh, they're usually around like for two hours. So if there's a workshop you're interested in, uh, please join now. I have to say that uh, I was told just this morning that if you look the, uh, for the schedule in the, uh, through your cell phone, it's not showing. So I don't know what's happening there. But if you do it through the computer, it shows you all the, uh, um, the schedule for the talks and the, uh, the workshop. Okay. Uh, obviously, we, we're running behind uh, the entire day, but uh, we're, we'll try to catch up as, as, as the day comes in. So it is my pleasure to have uh, another great presenter, uh, Ken. Uh, he's a senior presenter, and he's going to be, well, actually, I didn't know about this, but his three talk that you're going to uh, see today, also the workshop, he's going to give this at uh, uh, Black Hat Union. Is that correct? Black Hat Union, and besides, London, here you go. So uh, this is a central for Pacific Islanders. So here, for the people who cannot make it to, to England, uh, that will be right here. So with that, thank you, son. Thank you. It's our fault when it does it. Yeah, exactly. It's really easy. That works. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Ken Weston. Uh, I am uh, from Fields and Sweat Panther currently. Uh, prior to uh, working at Barry Sim Ventures, so I've been one of there for about four years, one of the first security specialists, and then Elastic. Um, but prior to that, I actually had a startup where I was actually tracking. I had uh, various uh, tools and technologies that I developed, um, and also built some techniques uh, that uh, helped me track criminals. Um, we were recover stolen devices, and um, it ended up being some, some interesting stories. Is a lot of times the stolen devices would lead to other crimes. Uh, we would go in and find organized crime groups, um, and I ended up helping law enforcement quite a bit with some of those investigations. Um, and so that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today: is some of those investigations, some of the things that I learned, um, particularly when we start looking at even the smallest piece of information um, can actually um, help us in an investigation. Um, I even built a tool that was going through and actually mining exit data out of images. Um, so imagine that where you have a serial number of a camera, you put that into a search engine, and you're able to find a camera that was stolen from you a year ago. Um, that's uh, one, one thing that we were able to do. Um, so um, I, I live in uh, on the beach in Oregon. Um, I'm currently in Florida Panther, so I've been remote for a long time, still on airplanes, travel quite a bit. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I like uh, collecting uh, guitars, records, and a bit of a hoarder. I got a little bit of ADHD myself. Um, and I've been in security for about 15 years. I think a lot of people ask me, how do you get into cybersecurity? I'm trying to find my way out. Um, and also, uh, kind of this presentation too, I was trying to figure out how did I get started in security? Because I really, I just kind of followed the path of what I was passionate about. It wasn't really like, I'm going to go get a, a degree in cybersecurity. My first degree was actually in English literature. Then I, I got into programming and I went back and got a master's degree on um, uh, internet system development. Um, so uh, this is my uh, wall of shame. So these are some photos of, uh, I actually recaptured the stolen laptops of uh, people that would steal and steal them or um, other uh, other devices as well. I even got into mobile devices. I started with uh, flash drive and USB and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, these are all of the, the various uh, criminals that I was able to catch. A lot of these ended up being organized crime groups. We'll talk about some of the cases. 
I did a presentation around this at DEF CON, uh, and uh, some of the media got a little, uh, a little crazy with it. Uh, if you ever want to get become a doxing target, um, have them go out and tell you that you're the real life Mr. Robot. Um, yeah, I would pay super interesting friends. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, I call my talk uh, Confessions of a Professional Cyber Stalker. Of course, BBC put that on the headline. That was nice. Thanks, guys. Um, so, uh, anyone know who this guy is? Nobody ever knows who this is. You uh, are criminal. Um, so in this concept, um, this is Edmund Lucard. So he was uh, sort of the the uh, sort of the grandfather of forensic science. They called him the the French Sherlock Holmes. Um, he actually uh, kind of pioneered a lot of the uh, forensic uh, um, technologies that we even use today, even um, identifying things like fingerprints, uh, things like that. Um, but he has this uh, uh, concept it's called the cards exchange principle. It's every contact is a trace. And this is something I found, I was really intrigued by it because I found that this applies to the digital world as well. The idea is that when someone commits a crime, not only do they leave something behind, they also take something with them. Um, and I believe this carries over into the digital world as well when we're conducting our investigations. The trick is trying to find the piece of information. Um, of course, sometimes we don't have access to all the logs, right? Or um, all, we don't have a full picture of, of what we're actually trying to do in our investigations. But if we dig deep enough, usually we're able to identify and pull on those strings. And we'll, we'll see that in some of these actual investigations. Um, ever, ever seen these like the crazy balls? This is kind of how my, my, my brain works when I'm um, kind of doing deep uh, <laughs> research into a target. Um, I still do a little bit of uh, investigations, uh, mostly doxing assholes um, on, on the internet, um, people that are uh, targeting, uh, harassing uh, you know, people in our community. Uh, sometimes they think that they're anonymous and they think they're sort of above the law when they do that. Um, and uh, we are able to actually um, oftentimes expose them and who they are um, and uh, hopefully make the community safer. So I got started with this, but um, I was really interested in uh, USB based Trojans. At the time I was working for a company, um, I was sort of a one man web army where I was um, sort of managing the web servers. And my first um, experience with security was just basically securing the life stack. Um, and so um, at that time, they actually had a, a tool that would um, block flash drives uh, and involved cloud slurping or, you know, uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, hacking from inside of the network is a lot easier than from outside. If I can plug a flash drive in, I can steal data, I can um, inject uh, using the Trojans. Um, it's a lot easier uh, to, to hack uh, from inside. And so and that's where I got started with this. I actually found a number of different tools and I published them on a, a web website I created called usbhacks.com. That was the first time the FBI contacted me. Uh, <laughs> I had to explain to them what my intentions were. Uh, you know, this, the whole thing was around raising awareness around um, these tools. Um, and so people could download them, they could test them out. Um, and then I started actually building my own. So the nice thing about when uh, people are doing uh, criminal things, um, they can't really patent up technologies, whereas if you're doing things to help people, you can. Uh, so I, I uh, actually wrote up, uh, had a patent, a couple of patents around some of these USB-based um, Trojan um, concepts and techniques. And um, I actually ended up uh, finding a way to actually use it for good. Uh, so the idea here is that instead of infecting network and doing bad things, what if I like I install a friendly uh, uh, agent on a USB device that will then send information to me uh, when that device is stolen? Um, and that was the idea behind this. And I, I put it up on, um, uh, it was uh, dig.com, so I'm sure you guys I made myself here. Um, and it ended up making it to the homepage. And I had like 20,000 people register for this free service that I was doing. Uh, but I was also using it as a way to mine information to find out what devices that we work with. So um, I had all these different USB devices. People were installing this uh, executable agent. Um, I'm really shocked that people were doing this. Like they didn't know who I am. They don't know what my intentions were. Um, but we had tons of people that were downloading it, and I was able to find all these different devices that would um, that actually worked with. So I found people were installing on on GPS uh, devices back in the day when you had a separate unit, a second cup, a second in your car. Um, there was all these different devices, everything from you know. From, iPods and, and different cameras as well. And I ended up getting uh, some recoveries, uh, quite a few of them. We actually recovered a, a lot of um, um, stolen iPods and things like that, mostly kids. And the nice thing is we would get information about the, the uh, name of the 
a family, like you know, usernames, things like that from the computer. Um, uh, really valuable information when we're uh, trying to recover something that's stolen. Um, I had a, another case where the professor, he had his uh, flash drive that was stolen um, and it had his dissertation on it um, that he was working on and he was a professor and uh, we ended up tracking it. I kept getting net connections from AT&T. I was like, that's kind of hard because you have an IP address and the only way we can really get more information about that is to go to law enforcement to, to get the name of the subscriber. Um, that, that was going to be helpful. Um, I found working with law enforcement a lot of times are very lazy. I know that's hard to believe. Um, but we found that there was a striking thing from a university. Um, we actually uh, contacted the campus security and we found that in this computer lab, they actually um, had a lot of computers that were stolen the year before. So they had access controls. They also had uh, cameras that were there. So we're able to then identify specifically there was two or three students that were actually in that uh, room at the time. We were able to get photos of them. Uh, we also had their key card from their, um, their student ID. Um, and then we were able to identify specifically who it was. Um, and uh, the professor and the campus security stood outside of, of his, one of his classes. And when he came out, that's when they were able to contact him. And you know, I didn't mean to try to steal it. It was just there on the thing. And I grabbed it. I'm sorry. Uh, but it was great because we were able to get his dissertation back, um, which he didn't have backed up, which really kind of also pissed me off. Um, and so uh, word got out about this technology that I was uh, building, and uh, you guys might know a company called FLIR. Um, they make really high-end thermal imaging cameras. These devices cost anywhere from $2,000 to $300,000. Um, but they also had issues with escrow controls, because these devices aren't uh, allowed to be in certain countries for certain use cases, um, particularly like nuclear, right? Uh, and so um, they contacted me and I worked with them. But one of the challenges we had is that everything they relied on an SD card. Um, and so if someone like took out the SD card and put a new one in, then it'd be able to get wiped. So I worked with them and we actually um, had something installed in the firmware that would actually go in and look to see if the agent was deployed. If it wasn't, it would write the firmware onto the, um, onto the, the card itself. Um, and I had, a, um, I had the um, executable um, disguised as my cat for an old engine. It's kind of cool. I got access to some of the cameras too. I got to play with a lot of fun. Um, uh, and uh, they, they actually uh, couldn't tell me all the cases, but they did use it for theft recovery um, in a number of cases. Um, they also didn't tell me that it, they, they did find a violation of the export controls. Uh, they actually found um, we embedded uh, various uh, unique IDs uh, into the different executables. So different distributors had different um, IDs that were embedded. And we're able to identify that, um, yes, the one distributor was actually selling these to a uh, the different country that was not allowed to have these devices. Um, so then I, I kind of got further down the rabbit hole. Um, I, I wanted to think about, you know, okay, these flash drives and these little devices are great, but what about laptops? Um, at the time, there was a company um, called uh, Apple Software. They actually uh, had licensed the Lojack name for the laptop uh, software. So they called it Lojack for laptops. Um, but it was a very invasive uh, technology because it actually provides a backdoor uh, to that company in your system. Um, they would hire like ex police officers to, to uh, help with the investigations. And so I thought there's got to be a better way. Um, at that time, um, the first iPhone came out um, and it wasn't, didn't have GPS chips. So I was like, that's amazing. How's this work? And I found out it was this company called Skyhook Wireless. I contacted them. I told them what I wanted to build. And so we were able to actually um, integrate this sort of Wi Fi positioning technology into the software. So we can actually get um, the location within 10 to 20 meters. Um, simply just by sniffing Wi-Fi networks. And we would also, at the time, more laptops were having web cameras, so we also integrated with that. So I was also able to get photos of the person that had the laptop as well. So the idea is if you, your laptop was stolen, you would log into our UI to activate tracking, and then um, we'll start sending that information. Um, at that time, I didn't want to set up, a, you know, manage a server, typically something like this. So I integrated with a Flickr. So if you had, you just had to set up your Flickr account, and that's where we sent um, all of this, uh, this data. Later on, we did build out a server that was secure and things um, for that. But uh, when I started out, I just used what was there. Um, got our first recovery. Um, this was, uh, was in New York. Uh, it was an iMac that was uh, stolen, um, along with a bunch of camera equipment. Uh, someone's house was uh, burglarized. Um, and so I had to work with the police. Like, um, they, they were used to the old approach of doing this. So I great. Like, now I have to do a bunch of paperwork, you know, get this IP address. I had to tell them no. This is, I'm telling you, this is within 10 to 20 meters of where this person is. Uh, we also have a photo. 
And then he was like, saw the old paperwork. And I was like, look, just take a uh, print out a photo, ask people around this area if they know who this is. And then he was like, don't tell me how to get my job. Um, but he did. Um, and, and we were able to identify this guy. He actually owned a tattoo parlor. Um, and this is the back room. You can see in the back, there's a lot of other cool stuff, like all kinds of musical equipment, um, other stuff. When they went in, they actually found four laptops as well. So on that one, I said we had like a 500% recovery rate because we recovered other people's stolen laptops as well. Um, so there was another uh, fun one that uh, there was a, a group of uh, organized crime group that was actually targeting uh, um, Portland schools. They would get a new laptops and like within two weeks, they would get stolen again. Uh, so I worked with uh, them and I actually deployed our software uh, to a number of um, Macs. We, we didn't even lock them up, we just set them up on the counter. Sure enough, uh, within a few weeks, they were stolen. Um, I was able to trace them uh, to a house in Vancouver, Washington, just across from Portland. Um, and come to find out, this was a, a pretty bad group of the Russian uh, organized crime group. Um, and they were uh, stealing a lot of these and then they would fence them. Um, we have all these photos of inside their network. Uh, to pull the police, they went to the house and uh, to, or at least where they thought was the house. And it was the guy that did the, the cops roof. Like uh, what team group and he's like, you don't know what you're talking about, and you're you're wasting police time. So I got pissed off and I went out there with my 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 big Wi-Fi antenna, and I'm so, I was actually parked across the street, and uh, one of the Wi-Fi networks said like it was Russian pride, and then I looked over and the house next to it there was a car and it had this big Russian pride bumper sticker right on it, and then I, as I'm sitting there actually sniffing the Wi-Fi networks, out walks the guy I have a photo of. Um, and I was like, oh crap. And so I'm, I'm look, trying to look, look like I'm just looking for directions. Um, and then finally I called the police and then they went out there. And there was about six or seven people that were involved in this. Um, and then finally, the police, uh, they were, I didn't have to uh, testify. We got them to think they all ratted on each other. Um, we recovered a bunch of stolen property. We even recovered a stolen car um, in this case. And then the guy's like, uh, the police said, yeah, that, that guy's, you know, he's kind of a low level criminal, but you know, the guy across the street who's his friend who also works with him, he's, he's bad news. I mean, you like, mean the guy where I had my car parked right in front of his house? And he goes, yeah, he was like, I think he was, he was in for manslaughter or something. Thanks, thanks guys. <laughs> Um, so we had another one. This one, uh, this one, I, I, we I got a laptop stolen, and I didn't get any connection for weeks. So I figured, oh, they ripped the hard drive out, they reformatted it, they sold it for parts. Like, no way we're going to get back. But then I started getting connections. Um, and the nice thing about this was Victor. He actually changed the username on the computer to his full name. So I had his name. I had all sorts of photos of him doing all sorts of interesting things. So there was some stuff going down in a hotel. I can't go into it. Um, and uh, I, this is where I actually started doing a lot more research. Um, I found that uh, he's a big power uh, seller on eBay. He was selling uh, car parts, so probably stolen. Um, he's also really into Scion, and he uh, posted photos of his car in his forums. I also had license plate numbers. Um, and then he ended up selling that laptop along with a bike to his uh, friend Omar. Um, but uh, the police went in here again. What happened was that uh, Victor's father uh, gave him a stolen laptop. Um, what they did was they would load up stolen uh, 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 a bunch of stolen property into a van, um, and then they would drive it down to Missouri, and they would exchange stolen property because the first place you're going to look if your laptop is stolen is going to be your local Craigslist. So that's how they were able to get around this, and they would basically swap stolen property. Um, and it was Victor's father who was one of the um, ringleaders of this, and he gave the laptop to his uh, son for a uh, birthday present. So he also got a criminal record. Thanks, Dad. I had another one where we actually tracked, uh, this was in Brazil. Um, this was a Nancy one, it was actually a carjacking. Um, um, you know, it was a veterinary student. Um, he had his laptop in the back. Um, these guys like uh, pulled the driver out and beat the crap out of him. Um, and I guess they this group had been doing a lot of this and they were stealing cars. Um, so the, uh, worked with the uh, police there and um, they were really happy to recover because I think there were like five or six other assaults um, that these folks had done. So not only did we recover stolen property, but we also helped solve some violent crimes as well. Uh, then I got into smart, uh, more into uh, smartphones uh, at that time, um, but I found that people really don't care so much about the value of the device, they care about the data. Uh, so we built a way to actually uh, back up all of your photos. Uh, it was kind of cool the way we did it is that you would put in an encryption key on your device, 
and then we would we encrypt it with that um, data. And then when you uh, want to download it, you would have to download the zip file, and then you'd have to enter in your encryption password to decrypt it. Uh, the nice thing about that is, like, if law enforcement came to me and said, "Hey, I need this person's uh, all their photos and all their contact information," uh, I just give them a, a big encrypted blob, and you have to go to the, the customer to get that key. Uh, that helps uh, also with some liability issues on my end as well. That information is compromised. But uh, this whole startup thing didn't. Um, you know, I was able to raise some money and things, but uh, yeah, we, we I, I ended up getting burned out and uh, we didn't go too far with it. Um, but uh, I did have um, Sprint stores. Um, they have a lot of devices that get stolen from the store themselves. Um, and so uh, this is a story that we have that talks a little bit about that. Some rates and details go for past you answer that okay? Police and investigators on the trail of swiped cell phones. He's live outside the Washington Square Mall with the theft of clubs and so basically a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, cameras got stolen from them on this kind of walkthrough. Um, so they had a bunch of uh, cameras that were stolen. They were uh, or, uh, phones that were stolen, but they actually had a camera of, of them doing it. Um, and then we also had um, tracking software installed on them. We actually did the tracking. And then um, they were able to get uh, photos of them. We were able to get um, some other um, information, uh, particularly around location. It was great that they were actually taking photos of themselves with the camera. So we had um, all those. Um, it was tricky because some, some, sometimes the phones, the, the GPS wouldn't work so well. But we did get um, the more accurate location from the images themselves because the GPS coordinates were embedded in the exit wounds. Um, and they used to say how it's credible evidence. Uh, and we even saw on the, I was pretty young back then, uh, but we even saw um, um, a trip permit that they actually have on the back of the car as well. So that really helped uh, with law enforcement too. See right here, we have the, uh, we have the track there. Yeah, we. We were able to identify the specific car. And they, uh, uh, this girl, like he, he, this guy, Peter, his girlfriend, he sent her photos, um, and that's how we're able to track it. But it was just kind of showing how this actually works. Um, so kind of like we would just do, you know, with, with this, it, it was an application that you actually install on your own device, right? So that's that's one thing that um, I've had a lot of issues with, particularly around um, um, spyware, um, things like that, that they used to take for them to use. Um, they say it's, they, they use it only to track criminals, but if you uh, ever heard of the NSO group, if anyone's familiar with them, um, what they're actually doing is they're leveraging exploits and zero day exploits, and not only are they um, turned criminals, but what happens is a lot of these um, nation state actors, they're targeting uh, dissidents, they're targeting journalists as well. Um, there's been a lot of uh, stories about this. Um, they're actually blacklisted down by the U.S. government as a result of sort of their negligence and, and how they actually were deploying this technology. Um, so this is very different. When I was doing it, again, it was an app you installed on your own device, and I think that's okay. But if you're trying to you know, do this sort of thing where you're leveraging zero-day exploits and things, I, I have some expertise with that. Um, so kind of to the point too with this, when um, we were getting this, I got more of the GPS coordinates from the images themselves. So I started to get really interested in the exit data. And I found when I was doing my research that um, a lot of the high-end cameras actually embed the make, model, and serial number of the camera that took the photo, but there really just wasn't a way to search that. So um, I actually worked on a way to actually create a search engine. Um, I ended up mining all of Flickr. Um, and uh, I had a friend of mine who basically had a startup where if they're trying to do like SETI at home type of thing, but instead of, um, you know, finding aliens, um, you would actually get money. So I had access to like 500 computers and different university computer labs because um, I was trying to run like this Python script to download the exit data and things like that. I'm like, this will take like 20 years just to get all of uh, all Flickr. But when I had access to all these computer, like, like 500 different computers, I was able to distribute that load across all of them, um, and we were able to mine all. Of them. I think I was even talking to someone at Yahoo, and they go, "That was you." <laughs> they actually saw it was um, all these different um, connections where I was downloading all the images, 
I would then, um, you know, rip out all the exit data and put it into a database. You could then search. So you put the the, um, the serial number of your camera, and I'll show you all of the photos I was able to identify on the, the state with. And the idea here was for theft recovery, and it actually worked. Um, I had a guy named John Heller. Um, this is a, like a year after he had about seven thousand dollars of camera equipment stolen from him when he was on assignment for getting images. Um, and uh, found a bunch of photos. We uh, went to Flickr. He found that there was this user. That user also had a user account on Facebook. He was also a professional photographer, and he had a, uh, photos of all his camera equipment on his Facebook page. Um, and so um, the LAPD were involved. Um, and what happened was uh, the guy that sold it from him sold it on Craigslist, and then you know, that person sold it on eBay. And so we kind of traced this whole thing. The uh, law enforcement, um, when they went in to uh, identify the guy on Craigslist, he goes, yeah, I still have the address. So they went to the address of, of this guy that you know, was selling the camera, um, and they found all sorts of stolen property. It was in an apartment. Um, this was a year later. Uh, this, so he's been, been fencing a lot of stolen property. <laughs> so I just think this is interesting that we can actually have this so like one little number, like one piece of information, right? We can actually identify um, you know, a camera that was stolen a year ago. Um, and then we can go and also unveil other crimes that have been committed. I had another one where um, this guy was, uh, uh, he was selling a uh, camera on Craigslist. And the person, uh, once you showed it to him, he punched him in the face, knocked him out, took his camera, ran off. Um, and then we were able to uh, find that, that it was sold to this, uh, this guy. Uh, I did some um, kind of uh, OSNs on him. Um, he had all sorts of uh, cameras. Every, like every three months, he would have a new camera. He advertised himself as like you know, a photographer, a DJ, um, and then he also had photos of himself like smoking weed and going 100 miles an hour on the freeway with GPS coordinates. So that was kind of interesting to law enforcement. But um, again, we start, you know, again, one piece of information and then we conduct an investigation, we can start to put more out. Um, this was also uh, used by ICE, or they have a cyber crime division and a child exploitation unit. Um, I gave them access to this. Um, the idea here was that. Um, sometimes maybe, maybe uh, Joe Pervert would um, you know, be using his camera for innocent images uh, for child porn, and he might be using the same camera when he goes on vacation with his family. So he's taking a photo of Disneyland, and we're able to identify that it's the same camera. Um, that's something that, um, that they can use in their investigations. Um, they couldn't tell me if they caught anyone, but they did uh, use the tool quite extensively. Um, then um, I actually, after uh, DEF CON, we got asked to um, hack a smart home. Uh, I'm not going to be audio, but um, I'll kind of talk through it again. But um, so we uh, we had but, but 24 hours to, to hack a smart home. Uh, we, uh, we basically got the, uh, the Wi Fi password. I used a cloud tracking service. Uh, it cost like $200 to get the, the password. But then I looked at it and I'm like, well, that looks like a phone number. To do a search for the phone number. And it was the, the guy, the owner of the house. It was his cell phone number that he has on his website for real estate. So again, I could have done a little more investigation. So I could have saved myself $200. Um, but once we got inside um, that, we found that uh, just use a Wi-Fi pineapple um, and all of the, the systems had default passwords. Uh, so I was just kind of looking up systems, like what's the default password? Um, I was able to get into uh, the surveillance cameras. So I was even capturing photos of, of people that were coming in. And that's what the idea was. We had um, you know, this amount of time to get in, and then they're going to have a party that night. And then we were messing with them. We were, I was like typing in like this robot voice into the um, their audio system. We were able to take the surveillance camera and uh, put it to put it onto the TV um, and just kind of mess with them. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, but yeah, here here's where I talk about the surveillance cameras I got into. But I, yeah, I was even capturing photos of everyone that came into the party, and I was even talking about how you know, we could have used that to, to do even more nefarious things. Uh, people were also connecting to the Wi-Fi. I also found um, a bunch of open chairs and things like that. Um, and we didn't go into all that. Um, I also found a way to flush the toilets because I had a cleaning mechanism. Um, they didn't show that. I was mad. I was like, this is awesome. And I kept hitting them. I kept flushing the toilet. Um, but it was just a cleaning mechanism that was scheduled. But I could have flooded it. I could have just kept hitting that button and I could have flooded the bathroom or something. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. That, that, that was awesome. Um, I, I also was uh, doing some investigations at one point and 
um, I ended up finding uh, there was a, a Telmax email server where um, it was actually in indexing all these people's emails. Um, and I found that uh, it was completely unsecure. Um, I reported it uh, to them. It was um, a, a big article on the economy about it. Um, but uh, we were able to, we did responsible disclosure, got all that stuff removed and um, we secured it. But um, it's kind of interesting now when you're doing these sorts of investigations, you can stumble into other, other vulnerabilities. Um, I also started working on, uh, did a lot of research around uh, black hats and white collar criminals. I found when I was doing uh, research around stolen credit cards um, and a lot of these underground forums, there had started to be uh, these people with like uh, kind of white collar criminals that were looking for insider information for stock trades. Um, and so I, I found that there was a number of cases um, and did some presentations around this. Um, some of them made around $30 million in illicit trades. Uh, one guy was actually a former VP at Morgan Stanley. Um, that was getting involved with this, and then he became a minister. Um, and uh, yeah, he made uh, he ended up going to jail. Uh, and I, I figured that there was a lot more to this. And actually, there was just recently um, uh, a Russian um, military officer that we found was involved in this. You know, a, a larger group. And it was probably around eighty million dollars that they actually made by going after non-public information, things around patents. Um, you know, anything that you can uh, trade trade on stock and have uh, you know insider information. So uh, this is kind of uh, when I, I talk about a lot of the, the data that I use for conducting these investigations, I kind of realized um, there's a sort of hierarchy of, of what I call data belief. You know, when we uh, we create things like maybe an office document, right? We, we, uh, we're not necessarily sharing that, that, that information, um, but then when we start to move things to the cloud, right? Then there's data that gets created um, it's a, a for us um, that can be um, exploited. Then we start to see that a lot of this, like, Data brokers, we see aggregated data, we start to see machine learning uh, being used for this for stitching together um, Google profiles. Um, and that's where we can see that there's uh, this data created about us. And then the shadow data, which is data that's compromised in data breaches. Uh, maybe you can find it um, in uh, your underground forums and things like that. Uh, but this what, um, happens is we have less and less control over this particular data. And nowadays, like when it used to be like we dox people, things like that, but the the best hacking tool now is just a credit card because you know if you have a credit card you can go to some of these data brokers or some of these sites and get all sorts of information um, about any individual that's going to be able to target um, and it's getting a little scary I'm, I'm i'm glad there's a lot of tools now like i meet me with a little bit that where you can get your address from me i've done it um i've been a target of some people that are uh, trying to find me um, get my information um and it's been really helpful to at least make it a little bit more difficult for some of those uh, folks and that's it for my presentation. If you want to reach out to me, it's my contact information. Uh, I'm going to be doing a workshop here. We're going to uh, do um, purple teaming and protecting this code. Uh, that will be around 1.30. So I'll put it in here. I have to leave right after that because I have to go to London. But uh, yeah, thank you for having me. Appreciate it.